At least the work I just let everybody in. Hi, Lou. Dad, how are you? <clears throat> are you there? The presentation went somewhere. There we go. Hello, Congressman. How are you today? Good. Is this Al talking? It is, buddy. Hey, thank you for uh, thank you for doing this for us today. It's an honor, Mr. Ricky. How's Al, the real estate business out there? You know, surprisingly, it's great, Lou. Even though the economy's got all its problems, real estate not much activity, and prices are holding. Well, I understand uh, residential is through the roof, it's continuing to be very healthy, but the commercial side I understand is having challenges and maybe having challenges for a while. Very interesting development. Yeah, a lot of restaurants aren't reopening. A lot of people that closed, uh, you know, just they were at the tipping point and can't get back on that. And a lot of landlords didn't get paid rent and still aren't getting paid rent. So the commercial side's pretty weak, but the residential strong. I understand now with COVID-19, a lot of people figured they can work from home. And so maybe the demand for office space may be a little challenging going forward. So a lot of interesting developments, but thank you for having me, Al. Thank you. Good to see you. On. Yeah, you too, bud. All right. I think we're good to go ahead and get started. Let me go ahead and just pop up our welcome screen. Thought I had done that. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Burkenda. Welcome to Orange Chamber of Commerce June Eggs and Issues meeting. Uh, before we head into, inter into introductions, I do have a few quick housekeeping reminders. If you are on our Zoom call, please make sure that your audio is muted. We are going on Facebook Live as of right now. So hello, Facebook, we are live. Um, you'll wanna also make sure that your video is off. If you have any questions, we would definitely love to entertain any questions that we have time for during our Q&A section nearing the end. So please go ahead and type those in the chat bar and on Facebook Live, you can type those in the chat and I will go ahead and address those as well. So today, without further interruption or ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning's guest speaker, United States Congressman Lou Correa. Congressman Cray represents Anaheim, Garden Grove, Orange, and Santa Ana in California's 46th district. He formerly served, formerly served as in Orange County um, as the California State Assembly, State Senate, and on the Orange County Board of Supervisors. Congressman Crea is a longtime Orange County resident with deep local roots. He's actually calling in today from Orange. We are so excited. Um, to this day, he lives only three miles from his childhood neighborhood. He is the son of working class parents whose hard work gave him a chance at success. He has spent his career fighting to protect the American dream and ensure anyone can reach it just as he did. Congressman Cray defends our country and community with his service on the House Homeland Security Committee, where he is chairman of the subcommittee <clears throat> on transportation and maritime security. Congressman Cray also serves on the House Judiciary Committee and is the vice chair of the subcommittee of courts, intellectual property, and the internet. His love for community and family is strong, and most weekends he can be found at community events throughout his district. I know I see him quite often out and about. So thank you so much, Congressman, for joining us this morning. With all that is going on in our nation right now, I am certain you can share some valuable insights from here in Washington to help us understand some of the nation's current issues. Welcome, Congressman. Let's see. Let me unmute. Congressman, I believe you're muted. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be with all of you again today, Congressman Lou Correa. Uh, started out the morning in a great way. I actually went down to the uh, the 24-hour gym, the city of Orange, across the street from the stadium, 
Anaheim Stadium and had my second workout in the last three months and it felt great. Nice. <laughs> so I feel good. Uh, and I am uh, here in Orange County today looking to go back to Washington in uh, another 24 hours or so. Uh, a lot of activity right now in Washington across our country. And uh, a good friend of mine told me recently, he said, boy, I hope this year 2020 is over soon. There's been so many things that are going on. And I think uh, he's absolutely right. But I reminded him, I said, we have more than half the year to go. And, and I think as policymakers, as, as Americans who want to see our country move forward, we need to take these times of crisis and make uh, lemonade out of these lemons. Uh, COVID-19 clearly showed us that uh, this country and this world is woefully unprepared for a pandemic. Uh, we saw the shortages of PPE uh, in our hospitals, in our workplaces. We saw a, a critical shortage of a lot of our medicines that we discovered were manufactured almost entirely outside the US uh, and the implications there in terms of our personal health and safety. And of course, uh, recently the, the uh, the social changes, the social unrest that we've had across the country, not to be dismissed politically. We can always say, oh, you know, we have an opinion as to what's going on. Um, but, you know, as a person who's lived in Orange County most of my life, completely, almost completely all my life here, um, I can tell you that we have the best police officers around. We do have some bad apples. And so uh, there is room for improvement. But the bigger picture I like to say when it comes to what is going on in society today is that we're giving police officers really a, an impossible task. Uh, we're, we're, we're essentially giving police the responsibility to deal with the drug issues, uh, drug policy, uh, homeless policy, uh, mental health policy. We expect them to fix these issues when they're completely broken. And these are things a police officer cannot be expected to fix. When you have a police officer that has a warrant to break in a door with a no knock, no knock warrant, mm -hmm. you are guaranteeing a disaster will happen. And so instead of arresting people, instead of going after people that have drug addiction, put them in a hospital, get them to a doctor, get them to social services and don't put our police officers in lose-lose situations. Same thing for the homelessness um, and of course for mental health. Recently uh, uh, spoke to another friend of mine about mental health. Uh, he reminded me of the most expensive mental hospital probably in the world are those twin towers downtown Los Angeles whose prisoners are mostly mentally ill. Um, so again, we need to take these opportunities and, and really question whether we're doing things right in society. And if we're not, what we need to do to make our society a better place for all of us to live. Um, COVID-19, coming back to COVID-19, uh, it's taken a major toll on our economy, clearly. Uh, Congress spent $2 trillion so far on a stimulus package that I think has helped us somewhat weather the storm. Uh, Federal Reserve has kicked in three to five trillion dollars, depending on how you count, on economic stimulus. Um, here in Orange County, our biggest employer is Disneyland. And as all of you know, Disneyland has been closed, um, along with 20,000 direct employees of Disneyland that have been furloughed. Uh, all of my constituents that work in the hotel, the entertainment industry, the uh, restaurant industry have all been out of jobs. Um, it's our job to try to get those businesses, those industries up and running as quickly as possible in a safe manner. Uh, all of us can debate uh, the issue of uh, wearing masks, which has become a political issue. But at the end of the day, 
It's really about keeping people safe and bringing back confidence to our communities, to our population, that we can begin to operate in a safe manner again. Uh, again, this morning I was at a gym. Uh, it was half full. Uh, the ones that were there were saying, yes, we feel safe. And we said, where are the rest? They don't feel safe. They're not coming in to work out. There's nothing I can do as a policymaker to get them to work out. There's nothing I can do as a policymaker to make fee people feel safe. We just have to get there with our policies and our uh, efforts, so to speak. Um, in Congress, I sit on two committees, Judiciary and Homeland. Homeland, I chair a committee that has jurisdiction over TSA. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time over the last few weeks uh, dealing with airports, with the airline industry, the airport industry, the employees associations, trying to figure out how we kickstart again the airline passenger industry and translation. How do we bring passengers back on planes? How do we keep them safe on a plane? And how do we let them know that they are safe on a plane? Uh, implications are, some of the logistics are, we've got to be able to uh, move people to security lines faster, meaning we've got to take their temperatures to make sure that they're not sick when they get to the airports. Uh, and that means temperature checks, that means other health checks. Uh, we've got to make sure that our TSA employees are able to check people for contraband at a distance which means all those plans that we had a year ago to buy these brand new expensive CAT scan machines, X-ray machines, we have to buy them right away as opposed to over the next 10 years. So we're trying to implement these little minute uh, public policy changes at airports that'll lead to people being safe when they fly so that we can get people back to, to the tourism industry to get back to visiting Disneyland, back to, spending money in Orange County so we can kickstart our economy again. Uh, I know. The last, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, you uh, know, I know that we rely heavily on tourism. Like you mentioned Disney, which is huge for us here mm -hmm. among the county and the beach communities. How can we help that segment of the business? Like what can we do? Good question. And um, I think the best thing to do is, is we all have to try to speak with one voice. Uh, one clear voice is to safety. Uh, will it, one clear voice is to what the process is to be safe. And that's difficult to do because as you know, COVID-19, there's so much we don't know. Every time you talk to somebody, it's a mask or no mask, social distancing or no distancing. Uh, and we just got to stick to a, to a message. I know Disney will open, I believe July 17th. Uh, we're hoping it's a, it's a safe opening but they won't open up to their full capacity for a while. I understand they're coming in at about a, maybe a fifth of their capacity when oh, they wow. start and they'll build up from there. Don't quote me on that, but I think looked at the numbers, it's about a fifth or a quarter of their capacity to start. But we've got to make sure people are safe and people feel confident that they're safe. Uh, COVID-19 is going to be with us for, in my opinion, for a while. Uh, we're going to come up with uh, medicines that'll help with the symptoms, with the swelling of the lungs, things of the sort, and hopefully we'll have a vaccine within a year. Uh, but um, I look at COVID-19 as uh, 911. Our life after 911 has never gone back to pre-911. True. We've had different ways of operating all aspects of our life. And I think COVID-19 will probably be the same way. We're gonna change how we operate, how we live moving forward. Um, we haven't had a pandemic in a hundred years. Uh, this is a wake up call. We were totally caught unprepared, not only us as the United States, but the world as a whole. And I think you will see us all take steps in the direction of being prepared for the next one which means we have to redirect investment, capital, resources. We have to plan for the manufacture of pharmaceuticals in the US, a lot more of it, as opposed to in China or India or anywhere else. We have to have more cooperation with our allies to make sure that the next one doesn't catch us totally off guard. Okay. 
I do have another question for you. So do we have or, or know of any other stimulus bills that are perhaps coming down the pipeline? Um, we've heard of a vacation stimulus bill, a back to work stimulus, and we're curious, you know, what's realistic and what can our business sector expect? Glad you asked that question. Um, I'm going back to Washington tomorrow to vote okay. on uh, uh, some uh, police reform work. But I'm also going back to work on a, 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 an infrastructure bill. Uh, we passed the HEROES Act uh, out of the, uh, the House of Representatives is now sitting in the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Leader McConnell is working with the Senate and coming up his, his own proposal in terms of a stimulus package. Uh, you know, they're talking as low as 500 billion to the ceiling, which would be $3 trillion that we're talking about. It's interesting because uh, COVID-19 has really um, cost us a lot as a country, as a society in, in many ways. Uh, in the one lesson we are learning that it is better to invest right now to make sure we don't have a deep recession and it is better to invest right now to make sure that whatever it is that we're in, which is a recession, does not turn into a deep recession or a great depression. And that means a stimulus package. Just a couple of weeks ago, I went down to um, Bristol Street here in Santa Ana to buy a, a set of new tires. And uh, my uh, tire guy, he owns two tire shops. He's a very small guy. Mm -hmm. I asked him how business was. And he said, Lou, the first two weeks, after COVID-19 hit, he said, uh, this place was a ghost town. I did not have a sale. And he said, after their stimulus check started kicking in, he said, everybody started coming in for a tune-up, for new tires, for service. And he said, that's what kept me alive. That's what kept me in business. And so all of us, I believe, uh, um, are believers that we do, some, do need some uh, extension of the stimulus packages that we put into place. Uh, the question is how and when. Uh, uh, I'm again, we're beginning to talk in a serious manner with the way we have not talked for three years. Uh, we're talking very seriously about a, an infrastructure bill that, that'll invest on a brick and mortar, creating jobs, uh, getting uh, our infrastructure back into some kind of semblance of shape here in the US. And so all of the above are being considered, uh, uh, Burkenda. I'm just not quite sure yet what the final deal is going to look like. Okay. But all of us want something to happen to make sure that, that uh, the economy continues to move forward. Definitely. And I'm, I, I noticed the same thing as well. It's like your car has been at home for several months. You didn't go to work. You know, none of us went really anywhere. So once stimulus kicked in and things were starting to reopen, it was nice to be able to support those local businesses. Yes. And with that, um, I know people, you're out and about town quite a bit. Um, do we know of any feel-good stories, just of anything good that's kind of happening? That's a great story, of course, with um, your tire shop. But is there anybody else about town that we can support that you, or that you know of who's had a really nice turnaround during this time where perhaps they were doing one type of business and then transitioned? Or do we have anything going on in our district like that? Well, I, I, I think that... Uh... You know, the restaurants were clearly uh, hurt, uh, clearly pained, but there are other industries I think that were doing quite well. Um, I, I think to me, um, the one silver lining in this dark cloud is that people have come together to help each other out. Definitely. Um, you know, let's not overlook the fact that we've had uh, neighbors helping neighbors, neighbors looking out after each other. Um, I personally have been involved in food giveaways for the last uh, six to eight weeks, and I've gone to the Honta Center. Uh, I've gone to the Main Place Mall. I've been to many, many food giveaways. And, and the one thing I find are a number of volunteers interested in stepping up and helping to make miracles happen. I wonder, I remember this, this couple, these two young ladies I met at the Honda Center about two weeks ago. And uh, I, I struck up a conversation with them and uh, a young lady told me, she said, uh, I'm laid off. She says, I work at the Magic Kingdom. 
I work making magic for people. She says, I uh, can't do it at Disneyland. So she said, what I'm doing today is I'm making, creating magic here at the Honda Center by helping people have a meal. And I thought that was the warmest story. The, the just She nailed the message right on, which is don't sit home and cry, rather get out and help people because Definitely. this is what's going to get us over the hump. Um, uh, and I, you know, you, you hear that stories over and over again. Um, and I, I have to tell you that I, I'm very happy that as a people, as a government, Dems and Republicans have come together in Washington that have recognized the severity, the danger of a deep depression hitting us mm -hmm. if we don't recognize the economic ills of this country because of COVID-19. And I see us, you know, working together two solutions. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, myself and a couple of my Republican colleagues have recognized the dangers of uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is the pharmaceutical industry not manufacturing the drugs that we need for an emergency here in the state side. So we're all moving in the same direction, which is how to fix it, how to create incentives for the pharmaceutical industry to make yeah. sure that we are prepared for the bigger pandemics that can happen in the future. Right. Um, and you see that, and, and that warms my heart. No, that's good. That's definitely something that's very important. Um, what do you think will happen with the newfound health policies in the airline industry and other public attractions after COVID? You're beginning to see us roll out some of those policies right now. You begin to see that there's more interest in um, distancing, interaction, less touching at critical junctures to make sure that we don't spread things that we don't want to spread to people near us. Right. Um, I would like to see personally mm -hmm. moving forward uh, that we come up with a national blueprint on how to address pandemics. Uh, we had Zika, we had Ebola in the last 10 years mm -hmm. and those lessons were set aside. This is Definitely. not a political issue, but rather it's a symptom of government. Mm -hmm. We're always governing by crisis management by crisis. We move from crisis to crisis and we don't quite learn the lessons of the past. Ebola, Zika, there were some lessons there we learned, but we didn't carry them forward. Um, we've learned some good lessons and it is my hope that as we move forward, we implement them. One of them being, why did it take us so long to figure this out? Uh, was it the Chinese that didn't tell us? Was it the World Health Organization? Is it the federal government's responsibility? Is it Governor Newsom's responsibility? We shouldn't have to take 90 days to debate these issues. Right. Um, I discovered, for example, that we, and uh, within our intelligence network, our intelligence community, have groups that detected COVID November and December in China and nothing, nothing came forward. Why? Um, again, we, 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 we as a society, as a government, as a community, didn't react to COVID-19 in an appropriate manner. And there are so many lessons to be learned. And it is my hope that we take those lessons that the next time you don't have to debate these issues. You just say, you know, right. there's a danger, execute. There's a blueprint. Right. And I think that's why it feels like a lot of people and from what we've been hearing at the chamber, you know, a lot of businesses and people in the community contact us of the what was happening. And then all of a sudden it was an emergency and then just everything halted. So, yeah, it would be great to have some sort of process and learning in place where it doesn't quite come to that, you know, dead halt. All of a sudden it's kind of like, hey, this is happening and here's how we proceed from here. And we know like what the steps look like instead of it being more of a surprise. I know people have come to us with that. So that's, that's awesome that we're gonna be learning from this and hoping to move forward. We are halfway through this year. So 
<laughs> it's hard to believe we're halfway through. We're almost, you know, we're like literally at that center point right now. Um, what do you see for the nation for the next six months and even a year from now, as far as where we'll be like with a recession and hopefully not a depression, like economy, you know, what, is, what are we looking at? Well, you know, the, for the first uh, part of this year, the first half, I think the glass was half empty. And now I, I, I think it's important we look at the glass as being half full mm -hmm. because we know what the challenges are. We know what the issues are. Now we just got to go in and fix them. The economy, of course, very, very important, right along with keeping our communities and our loved ones safe. Mm -hmm. So as we uh, prepare to ramp up our industries to make sure we have protective gear, make sure that the pharmaceutical industry is there to manufacture these drugs in California, hopefully to prepare uh, to cure our, our communities, our, our population. We have to also make sure that we are supporting uh, our economy the best that we can with stimulus, uh, with investment, uh, like to see us uh, kick in resources to build housing, uh, kick in resources to uh, kickstart those industries that are hurting right now and get people back to work. Um, also uh, on the area of uh, police reform, we've got to look at what we've been doing, what we haven't been doing. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, drug policy is one, uh, for example, that I'm keenly interested in addressing um, I, I just, I look at 70 years of failed policy in this country, and uh, I don't want to see us continue to fight that same fight with the same factors expecting different outcomes. I think it's time that we sat down and had an intelligent discussion uh, uh, about uh, our drug policy. And this is, again, not a Democrat or Republican issue because we have people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, that that are, are are supportive of change in policy, and we have people on both sides of the aisle that want to keep policy as it is. We just have to make sure that we're playing this uh, in a smart manner. Uh, so I, I I think that the 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 issues, the questions have been framed for us. Mm -hmm. Now we just got to go out and fix them. Right. And in and the middle of that, we have to run uh, <laughs> November elections. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. Some things must continue. That's right. Um, you know, along the line still of the economy, a lot of our cities are facing some budget deficits um, and hopefully not, but it's looking like perhaps the cut in some of the services. Um, how can the government help with that? What Say that again. You? I'm sorry. Sorry you about that. Your question. <clears throat> so um, deficits. So a lot yes. of the cities are saying that they're facing perhaps looming budget cuts. Um, which means cuts in services that affect the community. Do we see any help coming from the federal government for those? That's probably the one area that I see um, that both the House and the Senate agree on in helping fund uh, local and state governments. Uh, I think the, the package that Mr. McConnell has said, Senator McCall has said he's interested in funding, uh, I think his, his floor is, let's start out with the cities and local governments and states and help them get through this. And then we will talk about the other parts of the economy. So I, I think there will be help there. Um, and I think you will begin to see deals coming together in the next four weeks. Uh, I might have mentioned that I, I will be leaving tomorrow to oh. Washington. That's my puppy over there. He hates the street sweeper coming by. Um, I'll be gone for the next two weeks, come back for a little bit. Then I'll be going back again for, for a number of, of weeks to Washington. So the next few weeks will be very, very busy. Hold on a second. Hey, guys. Hold on a second. Hey, guys. Come here. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of dogs do you have? I have a German, German Husky and a Chihuahua. Oh, perfect and combination. The German, and the German just spoke for my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love these puppies. 
<laughs> so um how do we stop businesses from moving out of state so for example i know tesla has talked about moving out to texas and you know other businesses are trying to figure out what's best for them based on you know policies of each state so how can we what can we do to keep businesses here we really want to you know keep everything as much as we can here in california and well, i <laughs> i spent uh, uh, a number of years as a state legislator in sacramento and, and one of my uh my my personal belief is we have to focus on uh, on deregulation. We have to focus on making it much more uh, cost effective for manufacturers to manufacture to stay in California. Um, this is a very expensive place for people to do business. This is a very expensive place for people to live. Um, we have the technologies. We are the center of high tech, we're center, center of biotech, medical equipment manufacturing. Uh, we are the center of, of uh, uh, venture capital worldwide. We are the gateway to the Pacific. We are in many ways, the gateway to Latin America. We are centrally positioned to uh, continue to grow as the fifth, the fourth largest economy in the world but we have to make it affordable for everybody to live here and, and, to, and, to, and to prosper. I would like to see us bring back manufacturing, uh, some of those jobs back to California. And I think we can do it smartly. Uh, we can come up with ways to assure environmental compliance, uh, safety compliance, without being overburdensome to a lot of the, the, the private sector. Uh, I was on a conference call a couple of days ago talking about, for example, electricity and uh, an expert made the argument that uh, uh, solar power is now cheaper than fossil fuels and we can expand and grow it. The key is for us not to mandate to the utility industry how to get the zero emissions, but rather tell them this is your goal and you figure it out. Translation don't regulate how to get there give people the goal and make sure they're able to reach it and i and i, I believe that that's that's absolutely right on you want the edisons of the world to be able to go out and provide the battery systems the the clean energy so that everybody drives an electric car just don't make it so darn regulatory burdensome that they you know it it, it is difficult for them to reach those goals Right. I think there are ways of doing it. I think there are ways of keeping California as a beautiful, uh, clean, smog-free place, arguably smog-free place to live in the world. Uh, because as you know, people from all over the world keep buying California real estate. That's another issue because everybody wants to live here, but we've got to make it affordable for everybody to live here. Right. Yeah. The dream of home ownership you know how how can we bring that to everybody and yeah and, everybody and as here. you know <laughs> right now people nobody wants to build in their own backyard not my backyard we all know that real estate uh, rents and the property values are going through the roof and part of the reason is that uh you know our our uh, housing supply is is very very low and mm -hmm. yet it's very difficult for anybody for any local city council to to build Right. It's just a lot of local resistance and we got to figure out how to address these issues and, and move forward. Right. Well, it looks like I have a couple questions coming in on chat. Um, one of them is so, okay. Yes, this is definitely a concern. Um, how do we avoid a situation like Seattle? Um, Seattle, as most of us know, has had a bit of a takeover in the center of town. How do we keep that from happening here? I don't think that's going to happen here. Um, I, I don't know Seattle. I've never lived in that part of the country, but I, I've, I live here in, in Santa Ana. I, I, mm -hmm. I talk to uh, uh, local elected officials, local citizens, and I, I don't think there's any plan of doing that here. Okay. Um, uh, I was out this weekend uh, at another food giveaway, um, and, and uh, the, the, the officers I saw seem to be getting a lot of public support and appreciation for the work. Uh, the week before, 
I went to another food giveaway and I struck up a conversation with another police officer. And he was the first one to say, you know, Lou, um, uh, the Floyd situation was horrible. It was murder. It was just incompetence by those officers. That would never happen here mm -hmm. in this area because we've instilled those reforms in California. Okay. And he also said there is need for more reforms. And, and so the way you avoid a Seattle for happening, in my opinion, is you have to have, the public has to trust our public safety officers. The public has to know that those officers are there to protect you and to serve you. And, and so our policies have to be uh, local policing. We, you know, that everybody knows who the police officer is down the street. Mm -hmm. Give you a story, another story. When I was in high school, a long time ago, uh, I was in sports. And one of my buddies got caught by a local police officer drinking. You know, the stuff you do as seniors in high school, dumb, dumb. Uh, the officer got that kid, didn't take him to jail. Took him to the football field and went to the football coach and said, I got your buddy here. I got your player. I caught him out drinking. He took him and made him run 10 miles. That kid learned never to drink again. That was possible, that scenario is possible because the police officer knew the school, the police officer knew the coach, the police officer knew the players. Right. Um, I've got legislation that I'm proposing right now to give grants to local police agencies to train local kids become police officers in their local communities okay it's a matter of trust right it, it's a matter of not being afraid to call the police it's a matter of the police knowing who the kid is on the street that has mental issues who the kid is on the street that has other issues and therefore when you respond you don't respond to a strange community or to a strange area but you respond to a community that you know right. and I think those are the first steps in moving in that direction. And I, I come back to a bigger policy issue, which, which is don't give police officers a job that they can't do. Don't expect them to change drug policy. Don't expect right. them to execute drug policy in our society. No, you're 100% correct. I, I agree. Um, so Orange County is, um, or Orange, I should say, is a central hub for the county for healthcare. Um, many hospitals, including Chalk that we have here, suffered through COVID. Um, what are we doing to help them? First of all, what we're doing at the federal level is trying to make sure that these hospitals don't go out of business. Mm -hmm. Our healthcare system has <clears throat> taken a beating. Uh, COVID-19, um, my wife's a doctor and, uh, uh, she sends me pictures of, of her and her colleagues at the hospital dressed up like they're going to Mars. They've got oh, space gosh. suits on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because everybody that walks in the front door is to, assumed to be COVID-19 positive, unless you know otherwise. And then, of course, if you do have COVID-19 patients, very hard to take care of them. And then because of COVID-19, your elective surgeries have been put on hold. Then because of COVID-19, people are not going to the emergency rooms because they're afraid to go to the emergency rooms because they don't wanna catch COVID-19. So the revenues that are local hospitals have crashed. Uh, some of the best performing hospitals that I know, I'm not gonna mention right now, are talking about layoffs now. And, and so begin to see our, our hospital healthcare system strained. Right. And, and that's what I'm talking about when we discuss the issue of preparing for, for the pandemic. The infrastructure has to be there, it has to be a flexible infrastructure, it has to be a well-funded infrastructure, which means money. And that is one of the things we're doing from Washington is that we're making sure we're, we're directing money to the local hospitals to make sure that they stay in business. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, that's definitely a concern um, of ours here. Let's see what else we have. All right. Um, question from um, our chairman, Al Ricky. What is your take on the upcoming presidential election? I, 
I have a couple of concerns, Al, um, with this upcoming election. And uh, my concern is, is more than just uh, the results of the election, but it's rather more uh, of the fundamental confidence we as Americans have in our democracy. Uh, last week, uh, the Supreme Court ruled on three decisions. Um, whether you agree with them or not, what it did was it showed that the third leg of our government as the constitution framed it, separation of powers, the judiciary branch was independent, is independent of the executive and of, of the uh, legislative branch. And that to me instilled a confidence in our system of government, in our system of democracy. My concern right now is that we're heading into an election where the public's confidence in the outcome will be questioned. Um, just a few weeks ago, again, as a member of Homeland Security, we learned of an incident uh, of uh, a group, an individual, a group of individuals in Africa that were buying Facebook pages and essentially uh, shooting misinformation to the United States. These individuals had connections to Russia, had lived in Russia, um, and they were put out of business, shut down by Facebook and others. But the point is clear that there are operators around the world that are now focused on propaganda, uh, misinformation being channeled into the U.S. to confuse us, to create havoc, distrust in our system. Um, People talk about voter fraud. People talk about the security of our system. Uh, I can tell you, and over the last few years as being in elected office, I have seen voter fraud, but it's been in the registration, voter registration, not actually casting ballots. But when you go out and pay somebody $20 to register somebody else, uh, you get a lot of fraudulent cards being turned down for uh, turned in for voter registration and a lot of these cases we turned over to uh, then uh, our attorney general uh, excuse me uh, DA Tony Rakakis for prosecution but my point to you is that my concern about the upcoming election is uh, the validity of that that election that there's too much information that is out there that is going to create uh, questions about the validity of uh, validity of our vote, and if there's anything the United States has done well over the decades is that we have had peaceful transitions of power, mm -hmm. and that has been one of the hallmarks uh, of our democracy. Uh, uh, back in the year 2000, when you had the election that uh, President Bush won the Electoral College, and and, and Al Gore won the popular vote. Um, we had a Supreme Court decision. Uh, I think it was four to five. Uh, that Supreme Court decision, uh, everybody accepted as being the rule of the law, of the land, I should say, rule of the land, rule of the law, uh, uh, law of the land, I should say. And we moved on and we accepted it. That is my concern that that will not happen this time around. And whatever the outcome is, we will have people that are not gonna accept it. Right, you're correct. Educate, I uh, can't even talk today. <laughs> What's that? Ed education is my question. Um, I had a couple of questions come in regarding education. So schools were closed or actually not closed, but moved online. So we had our pretty much all levels from K through 12 to our college districts all moved online this last semester. Reopening plans have been, <laughs> I can tell you know where I'm headed. Reopening plans are, you know, seem to be everywhere. Like school's happening, but nobody knows how it's happening. Um, where do you have any insight on that as far as any reopening guidelines, how, how it's gonna affect services, teachers' budgets, any insight at all that you can um, give our community on that? Um, clearly, uh, like the hospitals, like the restaurants, the, the education system is hemorrhaging as well. Um, I'm a father to three college kids. Uh, Cal State Fullerton has told us they're going to have online classes in the fall. Okay. Um, 
USC has told us that they are going full on live classes. Uh, and, and so you begin to see that different institutions are doing different things. And it's just, as you were speaking, I got a text from one of my local uh, school boards saying that they're gonna have their first live school board meeting coming up in the next few days. Okay. And so you begin to see um, people moving in that direction. I, I will tell you one of the interesting, you know, unintended uh, results of this COVID-19 is so many folks being at home. I personally had to upgrade my, uh, my internet to the fastest thing my uh, local cable provider provided because you got college kids and myself all, <laughs> all elbowing each other to get some bandwidth. But uh, it also showed us that a lot of our kids in the inner city uh, do not have access to adequate bandwidth. Yes. So it's not only the, the folks living out in the countryside on the rural America, out in the farms that don't have access to the internet, but a lot of our inner city uh, communities as well. So you'll see part of the infrastructure package after screaming at our, uh, our folks in, the, uh, in uh, that committee uh, has, I think, at least like $100 billion directed at upgrading our infrastructure system in this country for the, uh, uh, for the cyber internet, you know, uh, bandwidth kind of improvements. Um, so uh, what do we have in store for schools? I think you're gonna have major budget deficits coming up. Uh, I was in Sacramento when Jerry Brown was there as governor and we voted to put in a rainy day fund where that was uh, funded on an annual basis for that rainy day. I, I think Governor Newsom is probably burning through that rainy day fund as we speak. Okay. And, uh, you know, schools are going to be challenged. They're, you will have deficits because this, this thing has taken a toll on all of us. Right. Uh, do I have inside information? I don't. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that we're all working through it uh, and making sure that we can figure out this whole thing. And again, lessons learned. COVID-19 um, and how to respond to it. Uh, assuming that this is not the last time we will be hit by a pandemic in the right. next few years. It's just a tough time. I know, you know, I think some of the questions that we get from our community have been that, you know, bandwidth is definitely an issue and you're sharing with multiple people. You've gone from where there might be one or two people in the house during the day and it's kind of a little, you know, choke at night where all day, every day, there's no bandwidth. Um, that and also having to work and teach your children. So I know that a lot of parents have been trying to figure out what's going on. So I think we'll all just roll with that and kind of see what happens as things progress. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm watching some of my neighbors just like you can tell they've had it with their kids at home. They start yelling and I feel like saying, you know what, enjoy the moments because before you know it, those kids are going to grow up and they'll be gone. Right. I personally have taken the opportunity to start to bond with my teenagers again, uh, the way I had probably did not expect to do ever. And uh, so it, it's, it's uh, those are some of the positives. Um, and and uh, let me say that I do believe that our human behavior, our, our behavior socially, it will change fundamentally. I think more people will begin to understand that they can work from home and people start working from home much, much more than we have in the past. Uh, so look for those kinds of big mega trends to continue moving right. forward. So a couple more questions. Looks like we have one from Facebook Live. So oh my. there, <laughs> not to worry. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk recently about voter suppression. Kentucky closed most of their polling locations, particularly where there are higher numbers of people of color. How can we work to ensure that doesn't happen here in California? <sighs> Voter suppression, sadly, is um, a, a very popular and well-used tactic in elections. Mm -hmm. And voter suppression may take the form of anything is, is um, intentional, unintentional. Intentional is you, you send a letter out to people uh, in immigrant communities saying, if, if you're not a registered voter, if you're not a citizen, you shouldn't vote, it's a felony. Well, yeah, 
Uh, that that's kind of the statement you signed when you registered to vote. I declare under penalty of perjury, I'm not a I'm a U.S. citizen, 18, mm -hmm. and duly uh, able to vote. But when you send that to somebody in an immigrant community, you look at that letter and say, you know what? I've got so many headaches in my life. I'm not even going to touch this issue. Right. I'm staying away from voting. And, and we have to make sure that we come down hard on anybody who tries to violate the civil rights of individuals, the right to vote. At the same time in California, what we have done is we have made it easier for people to vote. Uh, you, know, you vote by mail. Uh, uh, make sure your, your vote uh, is received in a timely manner. Uh, easier for people to vote by mail. Those are good things because in my opinion, uh, the problem we have as a, as a democracy is there's not enough voter participation. Uh, um, and we have to be forceful to make sure that we have everybody's right to vote respected. The unintentional parts of, you know, of, of things that you can do that result in voter suppressing less voter turnout is things that you do like you, 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 you have taken the traditional polling places of the local elementary schools where you've gone to vote for the last 20 years and this year you've decided you are going to take all those voting places and set up one voting place in that community in election day people have no idea where to go to vote and people really enjoy walking up to those voting booths and, and casting their physical ballot uh, i know when i you know when i take my absentee ballot i usually walk it into a polling place and drop it off People like doing that stuff. And if they walk into that elementary school where they tradition gone to vote and it's not there, mm -hmm. uh, you've just lost the vote. And to me, that's a very sad testament to our democracy. So my answer to your question is we've got to be as forceful as we can to make sure that there is no voter suppression. It does exist. I've lived through it. I've been, uh, my opinion, uh, I've been victimized by it. Um, you, and uh, as, a, as a candidate, um, uh, instead of saying, wait, foul, I just got to push through it and I will do everything I can as, a, an, as an elected individual and as a citizen to make sure that uh, we don't have any voter suppression. That's just an American. And that happens in third world countries. It should not happen in the U.S. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much, Congressman. We are at three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have chatted for just about an hour. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Any final words before I head into a couple thank yous and some reminders? Yes, just wanted to uh, just put out a challenge to the folks listening here to please call my office, please talk to me, please give us your opinions as to what's going on. Uh, I'm out there as much as I can be. Uh, I'm out there talking to people as much as we can, but under COVID-19, it makes it a whole lot more difficult to hear from people. Uh, whatever you can do to uh, call my office or answering phones, send me an email, get a hold of me. Uh, I want to hear from you uh, and uh, I need input from you. Uh, I'm here to represent you. I work for you. And the more information I get, the more good information, opinions, thoughts, suggestions from you, the better I can do my job. I work for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. I hope that you were drinking coffee or at least having some sort of breakfast. It is an eggs and issues breakfast. So I encourage coffee drinking and eating while we're talking here and enjoying yourself through, um, throughout your morning. I had half my coffee and the rest, my shepherd kind of knocked down and it's all over the floor, but oh no, I, I still love my puppy. <laughs> We hope that you'll join us for our next meeting. We have our business networking group that's coming up on July 1st. That is an open format. So in that format, everybody can see each other. We like to network, do business with each other and support each other. So that's on July 1st. If you check out our Facebook and our website, you can grab the link for that. One last thing as far as so you can see where our resources are. Let me pop this up here on the screen. If you'd like to reach out to us here at the Chamber, you can find us on orangechamber.com. Any city resources, check out the cityoforange.com, or sorry, cityoforange.org. And our representative, Lucrea, again, thank you so much for coming today. We have his 
website here as well. If you'd like to find out how to reach him, how to call him, anything that you need as far as services, he can be reached throughout this email or this website here. Congressman, thank you so much. You have a very, very busy schedule. I know we've hosted you several times and we love it. I love it. Staff. I love it. <laughs> Keep calling me. Staff. Keep you on your keep me on your list. Okay. Thank you very We're much. Keeping everybody. you on the list. Have a safe trip to DC and goodbye, everybody. Have Take a great care. day. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.